You're watching Straight Talk Africa. I'm Heidi Adams. A very warm welcome to you. This week, a controversial exit from Afghanistan, bringing an end to America's longest war. Now the United States is signaling a new approach to the way it goes after terrorists around the world. We have what's called over the horizon capabilities, which means we can strike terrorists and targets without American boots on the ground, or very few if needed. What does this new strategy mean for the so-called war on terror in African countries? Our reporters and experts will weigh in. Also, we'll speak to a psychologist who has traveled to the heart of jihadi extremism and interviewed more than 700 terrorists. She'll tell us what she's learned about the way young people are recruited and radicalized by violent extremists. All that and more coming up. Straight Talk Africa starts now. Twenty years ago, the United States suffered a devastating terror attack that shook the nation to its core. Al-Qaeda terrorists hijacked airliners and slammed them into New York City's World Trade Center and hit the Pentagon in Washington with another hijacked jet. Those attacks triggered a 20-year-long war in Afghanistan against Al-Qaeda and other insurgents, a war just concluded with a hasty exit that enabled the Taliban to return to power. For countries in Africa, this departure raises concerns about whether Washington will stay for the long, hard fight against jihadi terrorism. VOA senior analyst Jeffrey Young has more. It was the longest war in U.S. history, Afghanistan, taken by force from the Taliban in the months after September 11. Then last month, U.S. forces departed. In the blink of an eye, the Taliban were back and in control of Afghanistan. To U.S. President Joe Biden, it was past time to end the war. We will maintain the fight against terrorism in Afghanistan and other countries. We just don't need to fight a ground war to do it. But that ending is unsettling to many, especially in Africa where both political and Islamist insurgencies have been waged for decades. We face threats from al-Shabaab in Somalia, al-Qaeda affiliates in Syria and the Arabian Peninsula, and ISIS attempting to create a caliphate in Syria and Iraq and establishing affiliates across Africa and Asia. At the research organization, the Sufan Center in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Africa analyst Jacob Zen says terrorists and political insurgents got valuable instruction from the U.S. pullout. I do think that African jihadist groups have learned a lesson from the Taliban's insurgency in Afghanistan since 2001. And that lesson is that if you can endure a larger and stronger superpower counterinsurgency force for two or even three decades, you can end up prevailing. The U.S. responded to Africa's instabilities by creating in 2007 the U.S. Africa Command, which went into operations the following year in multiple locations on the continent. The role of AFRICOM, as it's known, is described by South Africa Institute for International Affairs analyst Stephen Grulst in Johannesburg. It has reach in West Africa, in East Africa, in North Africa, Southern Africa. There are not a lot of uh, troops comparatively. Uh, I think there are about 6,000 uh, troops in all. Uh, on a very big continent that's three times the size of the United States. But it does play an important training, support, and logistical role in, in helping countries and regions deal with the many conflicts that we do have on our continent. Along with U.S. AFRICOM, France is working with African nations, especially in West Africa, to train and support those countries' forces. Some Africans say that the pan-African institutions, such as the African Union, the G5 Sahel, and the Southern African Development Community should take the lead in protecting the continent from terrorists and insurgents. Well, the problem is that these institutions like the African Union, the Southern African Development Community, the G5 Sahel, don't have the money. And they are heavily reliant on European donors in the main, 
uh, for supporting the African Union's peacekeeping budget. Um, so in an ideal world, yes, Africa would be responsible for its own security. In the real world, uh, foreign forces are definitely involved and uh, supporting and training uh, and helping Africa to, to deal with a lot of hot conflicts at the moment. A point shared by all analysts and many others is that in order for Africa to suppress and eventually defeat insurgency, the people in Africa's nations must feel politically and economically engaged and the rights of persons and the groups they belong to are respected. At the Institute for Public Policy Analysis in Lagos, Thompson Arioli says, people lose their faith in their governments and turn to the gun and insurgents that promise them what their governments do not provide. When the rule of law breaks down, everything breaks down. And that has been scenario in African countries where insurgents are, are on the rise because people then have to resort to self-help when they cannot get help from, from the conventional institution like the courts. So people tend to take law into, the, into their hands and engage in self-help. So uh, good governance, um, effective institution, these are the key ways to deter insurgency in Africa. VOA's Jeffrey Young in Washington reporting for us there. Jeffrey, thank you. Well, as the United States looks to reset its counterterrorism priorities abroad, security experts warn that the hotbed of jihadi terrorism has expanded from the Middle East to Africa. The Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, or ISIS, and Al-Qaeda appear to have not only found affiliates, but ripe recruiting grounds in nearly every corner of the continent. We asked four reporters from VOA's Africa News Division to map out the region's biggest terror hotspots. In Somalia, we have Al-Shabaab. Al-Shabaab is a transnational uh, terrorist organization that has been operating in Somalia for at least 15 years. Al-Shabaab merged with Al-Qaeda uh, nine years ago in February 2012, and uh, that means their, they share Al-Qaeda with their global agenda in restoring uh, or creating Islamic Caliphate uh, throughout the world. But locally also they have uh, local agendas. They have been losing all the major towns in Somalia, thanks to the support of the African Union forces, in support of the Somali forces. They have been taking a major town after major town. So Al-Shabaab larger is in the countryside, but primarily uh, they wanted to portray themselves to Somalis that they are fighting for their interests by telling them that their country is under occupation. That's why a lot of youngsters have been brainwashed and they are frustrated in joining Al-Shabaab. So the majority of Somalis with Al-Shabaab are under 30. That's because for the last 30 years, there were no jobs, there were no proper education, and people did not have opportunities, life opportunities in order to advance their living conditions. And they became susceptible to this kind of manipulation by ter terrorist organizations that were manipulating their vulnerabilities. It's only one region, northern capital Gadu in North Mozambique, where we have like issues of terrorism. As you know, there's a major oil and gas project, which was halted actually this year because of the insurgents. They say the attacks are by this organization called Ansar al-Sunna or al-Shabaab. But this is an al-Shabaab which is no link with a similar organization operating in Somalia. They apparently want to establish a caliphate. The U.S. has said it's linked to Islamic states, ISIS, and call it ISIS Mozambique. They mainly operate, as I said, in the province of Cap Delgado and mostly in rural settings. They have been killing people, beheading people, destroying infrastructures. It's widely believed that the insurgents are driven by inequalities, and by inequalities I mean the difference between uh, the south of southern Mozambique, where Maputo capital is, and Cabo Delgado in the north that is not getting enough state funding in 
areas of health, uh, education and development overall. The government has got its own narrative. They say the group aim at delaying development of Mozambique. And other people believe that there's a connection between this group and drugs trafficking, human trafficking, and that they also want to establish a caliphate. Terrorists are found in northeastern Nigeria, states like Borno, Yobi, and Adamawa. And also you can find another set of terrorists in northwestern Nigeria. In the northwestern Nigeria, it's purely uh, armed bandits and their mission is purely economic. The Boko Haram terrorists, they want to uh, create a caliphate uh, like that of Taliban and other terrorists in uh, Africa, like Somalia, uh, you know, Mali. They ransack towns, they kidnap people for ransom. Boko Haram, they are getting their support from Al-Qaeda Al Al and ISIS, from Mali, Libya, and of course, Algeria. They are getting um, money, and of course, they are getting arms and ammunition from them. In the center of Mali, you have the group Liberation Front of Masina. You have also Al-Qaeda, because Al-Qaeda in Mali means all the former jihadists who uh, were chased out of Algeria, they are based mostly in northern Mali. I think uh, they have the same objective like the Taliban in uh, Afghanistan. They want Sharia law. They want very tough Islamic laws. Girls don't go to schools. They don't work. They must wear veil. If you steal something, your hand must be cut. It's a challenge for local government because uh, they come, they present themselves as uh, anti-corruption guys. The youth also now is very desperate in all those countries of West Africa. They don't have jobs, they don't have hope. And if you see how many kids are dying through the desert to reach Europe or through Mediterranean, the ocean Mediterranean, you will see that how people are desperate now. The jihadists, they recruit, promising them jobs or maybe even paradise if they die. So. They have also a ground to recruit more and more people. And now you see that uh, the judges are having more and more sympathies from some people into those capitals. And uh, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Thanks to my VOA colleagues, they are painting a very sobering picture. So what does America's new strategy for the so-called war on terror mean for countries in Africa? And how will it shape future counterterrorism efforts in the region? Well, that's what I discuss with my guests. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to you. I'm just going to do a quick introduction here. Yetunde Omede is a professor of global affairs at Farmingdale State University of New York. Vanda Felba Brown is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution here in Washington. She's also the co-director of the Africa Security Initiative. And Mutaru Mumuni Mukhtar is the executive director at the West Africa Center for Counter Extremism. He joins us from the Ghanaian capital of Accra. Thank you so much for being here, Yatunde. Can you please start us off here? When you look at the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan, now the developments that we have seen in that country over the past few weeks, America's very chaotic exit from that country. What is the takeaway here for jihad terrorist groups operating in Africa? As we see it now, there are many fragile states in the continent of Africa that has definitely been a, a hub for terrorist activity, for terrorist training. When we're looking at the Sahel region, we're looking at northern Africa as well. Um, we have seen al-Shabaab, we have seen al-Qaeda, we have seen um, ISIS, we have seen Boko Haram wreak havoc locally. And I think 
Western countries, in a sense, think that, well, this is their own domestic issue and that they have been localized. However, the thing about terrorism is that it knows no borders. And so we, uh, and we have different priorities here at, at the given time due to the pandemic, due to our own right-wing extremism um, that has caused some terrorist attacks here in the United States. However, we cannot um, turn a blind eye to many countries in Africa that has been a hotbed for terrorist activity. The thing about what we have seen, especially in the case of Nigeria, Boko Haram, they have, in a sense, switched tactics. Years before, we have seen suicide bombings. Now we're seeing hostage takings. We're seeing kidnappings. However, if we move over to Mozambique, if we move over to Burkina Faso, we're still seeing increased activity in terrorist networks and their cells. And so the idea is that maybe they don't have enough bandwidth to reach, you know, Western shores and that they're only going to be active in those given countries. But we can't make those assumptions, and those assumptions can be a grave assumption. And I hope that we're able to find that balance between prioritizing our own domestic issues, but honestly coming together with our allies to really focus on many of these countries in Africa. This should be a very worrying situation for African leaders at this point. And it's a reminder of, you know, what it could be, what the consequences could be if we, you know, relax in terms of our capacity to provide or build resilience against terrorism on home soil. The existing extremist groups here see what is happening in Afghanistan as a huge source of motivation. It amplifies the ambitions, it amplifies the resolve, and gives them a false sense of hope. And African governments need to increase their commitment they need to escalate their commitment to fighting terrorism on home soil and creating an environment that is supportive of resilience, that is supportive for peace, coexistence, you know, measures that are reflective of, you know, the local realities in terms of vulnerabilities. And so this, at this point, all African governments or countries that already have, you know, insurgency groups, should be very, very worried about the reality today. A couple of years ago, we did not see terrorism uh, being a possibility in Burkina Faso. Today, is a, it's a growing reality that that could happen also in Ghana. And so it's important that we recognize the fluidity of terrorism and the fact that it can spread fast and in a deadly manner for all you know, African countries. And speaking of Joe Biden's new approach that Mutaro just mentioned in his um, speech marking the end of the U.S.-led war in Afghanistan, President Biden essentially said he wants fewer boots on the ground with more of a focus on what he called America's over-the-horizon capabilities. Is that a good counterterrorism strategy and is it a good one for countries in Africa yet today? You know, I think I think they're trying to focus more on containment than eradicating terrorist networks. And I think they're going to focus more on Al-Shabaab, which may have more international linkage and can have some form of international havoc in terms of their actions. And so terrorist networks that are more so localized, that are only targeting Pacific African countries and, and so far staying within the continent or may not have the bandwidth for international attacks, um, I think they're removing their focus on that. So they're probably going to focus on one or two that that really do pose a global threat and most importantly a threat to the United States and I think for them um, you know look terrorism fighting terrorism is expensive it's expensive but it's important right it's life-saving of course but it's expensive and many of these African countries don't have the resources economic resources military resources to actually contain it let's not even talk about eradicate it but also contain it. And so we have another issue in terms of weapons as well. Many of these militaries do not have the weapons that are necessary and that are needed to fight against some of these military who have used tactics as raiding other military bases within the country um, that are not protected and using that for their own um, purposes. And so we, it's almost a catch-22 phase. And I think wherever the United States positions themselves right now, um, Unfortunately, there are going to be some loopholes that are going to be left. Now, 
the U.S. has long justified its military presence in foreign countries on this need to fight terrorism where the terrorists are to keep the U.S. homeland safe. But Taro, what is the current national security threat to the United States and other Western nations for that matter that exists in Africa? There are several groups that pose a threat beyond the borders within which they operate. Even smaller, you know, extremist groups within West Africa directly and indirectly pose as a threat to U.S. interests as, you know, home soil within the African continent and outside of the African continent. And so there are several insurgency groups and extremist groups here, including Boko Haram, and particularly the Al-Shabaab, and those within the MENAD region, Middle East and North Africa, that continue to serve a significant threat to U.S. interests within the continent and outside of the continent directly and indirectly. And so you would expect to see the U.S. involvement in Africa, you know, beyond this point. How it's going to happen probably is going to be the difference here. And we are already hearing President Biden talking about a new approach to engage in Africa in terms of security. He is probably going to go very low in terms of military involvement here. And I think that is very realistic of the reality here on the ground because there's already some fatigue with security here in West Africa. We have MINUSMA that has over 2,000 forces here. We have the French Operation back, and of course, it's seeking to withdraw here. But we have over 5,000 of those here, including British troops, over 400 of them, and several other forces that are operating here. You know, AFRICOM has forces here. And so there's some sense of, you know, fatigue in terms of the overwhelming you know, engagement of security here. And so we need to move away from that to ensuring development-linked programs that address the, you know, the realities in terms of the vulnerabilities or the underpinnings of radicalization and violent extremism. That would be a realistic and sustainable approach to dealing with terrorism within the African continent. Look, if we focus security measures you know, it measures our focus on state rather than on the people. We would not succeed in dealing with terrorism here. And so we need to focus to begin to look at what are the driving, you know, forces? What are the vulnerabilities? What are the drivers? Because security measures are often modeled, you know, as a function of threat perception. So your perception of the threat, your analysis of the threat in terms of what it is would lead you to certain measures. And if you diagnose wrongly, you would inevitably provide wrong measures. And so it's important that we, you know, look at the suggestion or the approach of, you know, the U.S. at this point and see how we can, you know, ensure that that approach addresses the realities here. And Vando, what is your take on President Biden's counterterrorism approach that he laid out recently? And do his allies in Europe and in Africa and elsewhere necessarily share that vision? Uh, well, first of all, we need to unpack what is the so-called counterterrorism strategy of the Biden administration. And in its core essence, it is certainly moving away from um, very large open-ended military deployments. What the strategy has not disavowed uh, is uh, the effort to train so-called partner capacities, which is to be building up counterterrorism forces uh, abroad. However, uh, Afghanistan and frankly what's happening in Somalia should give us uh, some real pause as to the effectiveness of training those counterterrorism forces, which in many parts of Africa are deeply inadequate, highly factionalized, often used as Praetorian guards uh, of um, the leadership and often tend to be very brutal, very heavy handed. The prime example here uh, on the brutality scale and still struggling to hold territory is Nigeria, a prime example of the factionalization's reliance on local militias would be uh, Somalia. And the forces in Mozambique, um, also, for example, very, very um, weak, um, uh, struggling with the, in the, with the insurgency in Cabo Delgado. The, the thrust then uh, of sort of pulling out, not deploying large military forces, only deploying trainers, uh, 
Uh, I think it's inevitable. Is this is uh, very unlikely going to change. There is simply no appetite uh, in the United States domestically and frankly strategically in moving into operations that would involve large scale deployments. And it's not just uh, a US appetite. I mean, France has been the uh, key external leader in uh, Mali and France is enormously keen to get out of the conflict in Mali, even as the conflict is stuck in a morass and uh, the results are far from resolute victory. Uh, one could argue, in fact, the opposite. So we have these places that are highly vulnerable to what will happen when the draw of international forces takes place. When Amisom withdraws from Somalia, there is a high chance that Shabab will be able to retake uh, much of Somalia at the south of Puntland. Yet there is also simply uh, waning appetite, uh, not just in the United States, but uh, also in Africa itself, to be rushing into those um, long-term military deployment. It's quite striking, for example, how the SADC um, intervention in Mozambique is structured, but it speaks about uh, the mission ending in October, even though the forces were just deployed several weeks or months ago. Over the past 20 years, U.S. engagement in Africa really preponderantly centered on terrorism issues and countering terrorism, often in ways that were deeply unhelpful for Africa, where the United States in particular, but not just the United States, uh, was willing to subordinate its other interests in democracy, human rights, accountability, and sometimes even economic issues to uh, uh, just very narrowly structured, narrowly conceived uh, uh, counterterrorism agenda. And many African governments took advantage of that. They appropriated this counterterrorism narrative to crack down on domestic political opposition, on human rights groups. They would label their political opponents as terrorists. And they appropriated uh, the largest of U.S. training and money to be developing, to, to be shaping the security forces so that they were useful for their protection, for the regime's survival, rather than necessarily for being effective on the counterterrorism uh, military battlefield. So the fact that the U.S. might be looking elsewhere and might have uh, uh, an agenda that focuses on terrorism, but where terrorism is more balanced with other issues, might also bring uh, some uh, very important, very real benefits. And certainly at least provides the theoretical possibility of uh, broad recognition that counterterrorism cannot be just about building special operations forces, units like the NAV, but that it also needs to be about addressing the broader um, uh, political economic grievances. Uh, but it's a hard lesson and one that many African governments do not want to hear. They're very comfortable with counterterrorism being simply about limited uh, uh, military operations. And we'll have more from that discussion on the other side of the break. And later on, I'll introduce you to the psychologist who has gone into the homes, villages and strongholds of some of the world's most violent extremists. She'll tell us what she has learned from talking to terrorists. We'll be back in a moment. Health, wellness, sport, beauty, medical breakthroughs. Healthy Living cares about your well-being. What are the main health concerns in Africa and around the world? Find out the latest on coronavirus. Connect with our experts and ask them questions. How long does the virus stay? Join me, Lino Khmudu, in Washington every week on Healthy Living, right here on VOA. You're with Straight Talk Africa on VOA. Welcome back. What does America's departure from Afghanistan mean for the war on terror in African countries? And is the jihadist battleground moving from the Middle East to Africa? Here's more now from my conversation with Mutaru Mumuni Mukhtar, Vanda Felba Brown and Yetunde Omede. I want to turn now to an op-ed by Nigerian President Muhammadu Buhari in the Financial Times recently, where he essentially lays out the case for why, as he put it, Africa needs more than military aid to defeat terror. He also says the so-called war on terror was never really a global one. Let me pull up some of what he wrote. He says, as Africans, we face our day of reckoning, just as some sense the West is losing its will for the fight. 
He says it is true that some of our Western allies are bruised by their Middle Eastern and Afghan experiences. Others face domestic pressures after the pandemic. Africa was not then, and even less now, their priority. Yetunde, does the Nigerian president have a point? And do you foresee Africa now moving up or down on the West's list of counterterrorism priorities? A lot of the, the, the grounds that have been created that has fermented terrorist activity has really laid on the shoulders of many of the leaders of African countries. We see a bulging in terms of the number of young people, young men who are involved in terrorist activity. And we don't ask questions as to why is that? What climate has been created that allows so many of these terrorist networks themselves to operate in many of these countries? Uh, why is it that that, in a sense, has not necessarily been addressed? And I believe Vanda made a very good point where many of the focus have been just trying to contain terrorist activity, but not really getting to the root cause of it. Many of the root causes of it is that many of these countries are fragile in a sense. If we look at Somalia, if you look at Nigeria, if you look at Burkina Faso, if you look at the DRC, if you look at many of these countries, high levels of unemployment, um, levels of poverty, these are all mixing factors of what pushes um, people to engage in many of these activities. Some of them engage in it knowing its consequences, but engage in it out of need, out of desperation, as, of, as being promised that there's money, here's something, I'll take care of your family. And also coupling with religious antidotes in it. So all of these cli climatic things that are not being addressed by the heads of states themselves and trying to put it on the responsibility of the United States and Western countries to um, sort of be the director of, to me, I think is really a really wrong approach. As the United States is probably going to shift and push many of the focus to try to have regional organizations like the G5 Sahel to focus more so on terrorist activity within the continent and within their countries, I also think that shift is also saying here, look, it's, it's not that we're not walking, it's not that the United States is walking away. I'm sure they're very aware are very aware that this is a, a real situation that is going on, especially in many of the countries that are very, very fragile. And again, as we know, borders are there, but terrorism goes beyond borders. And, and at the same time, how do these countries and these leaders, how are they going to take accountability for addressing the climate that has been there, the grounds that have been created that continue to uh, make their place a safe haven? actually, for terrorist activity. Um, and, I, and, and I think that's the balance that a lot of Western countries are trying to sort of create, where it's not that they're stepping away, but more accountability and more leadership needs to be stepped up um, with many of the African countries. Vanda, for me, among the most disturbing images that came out of Afghanistan in the past few weeks were those of American military equipment left behind that the Taliban now have access to. Does this speak to some of the unintended consequences of the U.S. and its Western allies coming in and providing counterterrorism training and support? And can these weapons and resources be used in unintended ways that could end up hurting ordinary citizens? What you are really referring to really is the issue of uh, the uh, Taliban defeating uh, within 10 days the Afghan security forces and being able to capture a lot of the equipment that the United States uh, over the past 20 years uh, provided to the Afghan security forces. Now, a lot of that equipment is very sophisticated, uh, way beyond the sophistication of the Taliban and the Taliban doesn't know how to use it or how to maintain it. It would either need to be able to bring uh, some of the uh, Afghan soldiers back into the Taliban to provide the maintenance or rely on external actors like Pakistan to maintain it. So the fact that if you are building a partner capacity and uh, the partner capacity buildup is not effective, the partner loses, uh, obviously that can lead to the leakages and capture of weapons to militant groups. Incidentally, this happens across Africa in the absence of the United States providing or some external actor providing those weapons. In places like Somalia, the Taliban routine, uh, sorry, Al-Shabaab routinely captures equipment uh, of Afghan, um, of uh, Somali national security forces. Uh, and uh, a lot of the Somali national security forces equipment is purchased legally or illegally in Ethiopia and brought to Somalia. So this issue of 
of equipment um, uh, finding its way to militant groups uh, is a risk, but it's a risk that takes place in the absence also of uh, external actors. Uh, clearly, uh, the, the military element is inescapable. Uh, Boko Haram uh, or Islamic State in West Africa province, really the, the more appropriate term for the entity there, is not going to be defeated solely through dialogue or is not going to end solely through dialogue, nor is simply addressing the root causes sufficient. The military component is critical and the Nigerian forces are deeply, deeply deficient uh, in that uh, element. So there is no getting away from building effective forces, but they also need to be dedicated uh, to the right issues and supplemented with, with other packages. And I would like to add, uh, you know, and I mentioned here that we haven't raised, you know, the, what we are already seeing across Africa is that uh, other external actors are very much getting involved in anti-militant activities that are labeled as, as uh, counter-terrorism. This is countries from uh, the Gulf, um, United Arab Emirates, Turkey, um, Saudi Arabia. It's also countries such as Russia uh, that are fielding either their own forces, um, perhaps parts of the Air Force, or that are fielding uh, military advisors and private security companies that are really not private security companies, you know, most prominently, for example, the Wagner groups. And governments uh, in Central Africa, for example, are, uh, as well as in the East, are latching onto those um, forces and, and buying them, uh, often in exchange uh, uh, with uh, providing uh, resources. So the Russian model is very much, we send advisors and the Wagner Group, you allow us privilege access to uh, minerals, for example. Uh, and many of those forces are far less focused uh, on any issues of proportional civilian uh, casualties, non-combatant, uh, preventing non-combating uh, casualties, issues of human rights. So the terrorism landscape, counter-terrorism landscape is becoming all the more concerning because of the plethora of these other external actors not even paying lip service to issues of democracy, to issues of good governance, to issues of human rights. And many of them are also using uh, militia groups and building up militia groups across Africa. Indeed, that is now by many seen as the silver bullet. Since the formal forces are deficient and building partner capacity is struggling, governments after government, country after country is seeing big expansion of various militia groups. Not simply in the counter jihadi, counter Islamist terrorism space, but more broadly um, with respect to many militancy or crime. And it is my final comment here. And we're talking about terrorism in Africa, and so far we have really focused mostly on jihadi terrorism. But in many of these countries, there are many other sources of insecurity and militancy uh, that are not Islamist. Well, the so-called war on terror sounding much more like a wild west of its own. But we have been talking about this prospect of international troops withdrawing or drawing down. Mutaru, will Africa as a bloc or as a region have the capability to at some point go it alone? Will the region always need international assistance? The challenge of terrorism in Africa is a new phenomenon, as a kind of threat, security threat, that is alien to our security orientation, either as a state or as individuals in our local population. And so African governments cannot, at this point, I cannot say African governments are capable, are, you know, resourced enough to be able to deal with the challenge of terrorism on the continent. And we've seen it. In the last decade, we've seen pervasive, you know, role in terms of the destruction of many parts of the continent and the incapacity of state actors to be able to deal with it. Of course, there's been huge, huge measures in terms of efforts from the state, but those efforts have proven you know, incapable of containing the threat. We lack the money and capacity to, you know, to fight it, the technical expertise that's required. We do not have that. And countries especially, that are yet to experience this, need to properly position themselves in order to build resilience against it. And I like the idea, you know, Yetinde talked about the fact that, I mean, we do not want the U.S. 
you know, to walk away from Africa in terms of, you know, counterterrorism measures. Of course, they might be reconsidering their approach to dealing with the threat in Africa, but walking away from engaging in counterterrorism, direct combat measures or any kind of direct security measures would be very, very counterproductive. You know, the battle against terrorism and the ideologies that underpin it cannot be won solely on the battlefield. It would be won in the local community, in the mindsets, in addressing the underpinnings, the economic factors, the ideological factors, the social factors, issues of marginalization, you know, inequality, and citizens and groups who feel they have to be left out in the bigger scheme of things in society. And Vanda, final question to you here. Look, I know we're talking about asymmetrical warfare in many cases, but I find it curious how a ragtag band of militants can be so successful at outsmarting their government forces, even with the backing of the world's largest militaries. It's one thing to game a foreign military in the rugged hills of Afghanistan, but in countries where the leadership knows the lay of the land, they know exactly where and how these terrorists operate. Yet it seems that it's the governments that seem under-resourced and having to try out different strategies, while the terror networks appear to be very organized and organized enough to grow in strength and in numbers. Well, you hit the question on the head, um, uh, Heidi. Um, you know, I often say uh, the terrorist the militant groups like Al-Shabaab or Islamic State in West Africa province are strong. The key problem is that governments are weak and often uninterested. The amount of resources that it would take both to field effective and accountable military missions, the, the accountable uh, often lags across many military counterterrorism deployments by uh, African governments and even uh, international African forces. Uh, but the amount of resources that it would take and the amount of resources that it would take to start addressing the local grievances, the local root causes, is very large. And it's far more comfortable for governments to do the minimum necessary to keep the boil at what the government see as tolerable level, often far lower than what local people see as tolerable level, uh, rather than really engage in transformative projects. So uh, what many African governments, and not just African, the Afghan government uh, were engaged in, was keeping the conflict at the level they were comfortable with. But of course, uh, that then led to the conflict um, boiling over. The second important issue to realize is that often, Politics in the capitals, away from those areas that are contested, are consumed by parochial politics. So, uh, you know, at the core really is um, a, a fundamental contradiction between what uh, people see as their human security and what uh, we understand as the national interest. And many local governments, local politicians, and even local militaries understand this political competition to get access to political rents or economic rents. And this basic dilemma that these counterterrorism efforts that the United States uh, has led or encouraged or supported over the past 20 years uh, die uh, because governments remain poor and because even very incompetent uh, militant groups can deliver governance that might be brutal but is predictable, tends to be less corrupt, ultimately allows them to become entrenched and sustain themselves. And in rare cases, to win. I mean, let's be clear here. Uh, the Taliban is an extraordinary insurgency, both because it survived for so many decades and because it won. It is very rare that uh, insurgencies actually end up winning. However, in my view, Shabab is well positioned to uh, take over much of Somalia once Amisom leaves. Vanda Felbab Brown, Yetunde Omede, and Mutaru Mumuni Mukhtar. It's time for us to exit this conversation. Such a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for your insights and thank you for your time. Well, it's time now to hear your views. So we posted a question about this on social media. We asked, what do you think can be done to curb terrorist activities in your country? Here's what some of our Facebook followers had to say. 
Joseph K. Solante in the Liberian capital of Monrovia says, in order to curb terrorist activities in Africa, we need to invest in the security sector and improve the lives of citizens. Stephen Akatwi Juka in Uganda says, the government should emphasize teaching men and women in their countries to be patriots. That, he says, is the only solution. And here's what Geas Elamia in Tanzania says, the only solution to curb terrorist attacks and threats is for the government to invest in security forces. Also, the government must ensure that security forces have a good and close relationship with civilians. This will enable civilians to report all unusual activities. That's a very good point. Omonua Okoubba says, we need economic opportunities so that everyone is meaningfully engaged and feels loved and appreciated. Omanua, I couldn't agree with you more. Still ahead here on Straight Talk Africa, my conversation with the American psychologist who talks to violent extremists and what she's doing to take down what she calls the brand that sells terrorism. You do not want to miss this. Stay with us. This is Straight Talk Africa. Welcome back. You could say the last thing anyone would want to do is talk face to face with a terrorist. Unless you're Anne Speckard, the American psychologist has interviewed, listen to this, more than 700 violent extremists, mass hostage takers and survivors, as well as the families of suicide bombers. She has traveled to their villages and towns, and in some cases, even stayed overnight in their homes. Speckard spoke to me recently about what those conversations revealed. I began by asking her why she talks to terrorists. I talk to terrorists because I'm a psychologist and I believe that if you don't talk to the actual person, you have very limited information about what literally makes them tick. And I started this work 20 years ago and wanted to understand literally what makes a suicide terrorist tick. Uh, why would they go and explode themselves to kill themselves to kill others? And I don't think you get that answer from talking to anybody but the person themselves. And when I did go and talk to terrorists, I learned so much. So it became rather addictive. What draws people to a terrorist organization? I always say there's four things that make a terrorist. There's the group, because there's very few people that operate without a group. There's an ideology, and the ideology convinces you that you can use violence in this way. You can attack civilians, you can, you can kill yourself to kill others, because people have to be convinced to be able to kill and to take their own lives. Then third, there's some kind of social support. So if you're in Gaza and everybody agrees with Hamas, it's going to be really easy to join. If you're in Brussels and most people don't agree, but you get on the internet and you get into a group where everyone agrees, it's going to be easier. And then fourth, there's what's inside of you. So if you're in a conflict zone, maybe you've had family members that are killed. Maybe your sister was raped by the enemy. Maybe your house was taken. Maybe you can't get to school on a regular basis. Maybe there's widespread unemployment. I mean, today we can look at Afghanistan and say, look at all the things that could drive someone to go to a terrorist group and say, take me, I, I don't have anything else, I'm so angry. When a terrorist group readies a person to go for suicide bombing, they do usually go into a dissociative state and many of them uh, report feeling euphoria and then misinterpret it and say, see, it's the will of Allah, um, I'm, feeling, I'm feeling paradise already. And think how powerful this is to someone in a conflict zone that has PTSD, can't sleep, constant flashbacks, no medication, no psychological help, and suddenly a terrorist group delivers something to them that makes them feel euphoric and that they're already in paradise. That's powerful. Um, I talked to a young man in Belgium that grew up in a very abusive home. He converted. 
and he joined um, uh, ISIS in Syria. And for me as a psychologist, if I was treating him, I'd go back to his childhood and say, let's get to the real injustice, the real things that are hurting for you, because you're doing all of this partly to protect that little child inside and, and to try to get just just that you couldn't get as a child. Other people fall in love. I mean, we know those three school girls that left from London, uh, Shamima Begum being one of them, and I've met her in Syria in Camp Roche. Um, you know, they probably were on a big adventure and escaping whatever their families had in mind for them. Falling in love is a very strong thing. We know people travel all the time when they fall in love and do stupid things. If you're from a country that doesn't have much money, uh, ISIS was paying good salaries and offering free housing and saying they had this beautiful caliphate. Many people went because they believed, you know, that Allah had decreed that the caliphate was to come back and that it was their duty to go and build it. So what tactics do terror groups use to recruit fighters and followers? And have these tactics changed significantly over the years? So it used to be, if you wanted to join a terrorist group, you had to um, meet with them physically, which meant they had to trust you. They had to you know, be sure you're not sent from the police. Um, then if you wanted to train with them, uh, they had to train you either in country or send you out of country. There were a lot of barriers. But nowadays, it's all, it, it, it doesn't have to be, but it can be 100% through the internet. So I can form a group around you. There's a, a young girl in London that she went on Twitter and started following ISIS on Twitter. And uh, she was amazed that they all followed her back. And suddenly she's popular. But all these people are saying to her, uh, you should come to Raqqa. And then they started sending her pictures of uh, beautiful swimming pools and villas and trying to seduce her. Tell us about the Breaking the ISIS brand project and all these counter-narrative videos of terrorist defectors and victims that, that you've produced. It was a joint idea with the U.S. State Department. This is 2015, and um, ISIS was in its heyday on the Internet. Lo and behold, I got people um, to talk to me from ISIS on camera. When we put these together, we call them counter-narrative videos, and we always pick from the footage a thumbnail that looks that it came from ISIS, and we always name the videos something that sounds like it could be an ISIS film because we want people that are looking for ISIS propaganda to click on ours. So right now we have a campaign that's running in Iraq, um, Jordan, uh, North Africa. We have another campaign running in Europe. And as far as the African context, we run um, counter ISIS campaigns, but we also uh, have interviewed 16 Al-Shabaab. They taught us to see the world in black and white. There was no intermediate tone. You're either a friend or you are an enemy. Now, your work also focuses on de-radicalization. How are extremists de-radicalized? And who, in your view, should be involved in doing that? Radicalization happens through belonging, uh, taking on the ideas of a group, uh, being taught, being coerced. Uh, so de-radicalization can happen in the exact same way, being separated from a group, which is disengagement, uh, being taught other ideas, uh, perhaps being coerced. You know, you may be in prison and be told your sentence is 10 years, unless you go to this de-radicalization program, you could earn early out. That's a coercion, but it's a coercion that moves you into a new thought pattern. And my view is, you need to have both psychology and Islamic scholarship if you're dealing with um, militant jihadists. Because on the one level, you need to understand 
what pushed this person into it? What pulled them into it? So if you have somebody that's acting on revenge, well, let's deal with that trauma. And and then on the other side, the Islamic scholar can be working with that person to, to say, you know, here's your understanding of Islam, but do you realize that that claim is based on a faulty hadith or you only have part of the scripture there? Let's go through the whole scripture. Most people had many disillusioning experiences in ISIS. So slowly, slowly, their radicalization undid itself and they were spontaneously de-radicalizing. The amazing thing is now that many of them are in the prison, they sleep like sardines next to each other and they spend all day and all night comparing stories. What was my experience in ISIS? Do I still believe it? ISIS leaders who got away, that ran away with the gold and let us starve in Bagus, were they righteous? And why are we in prison and they're free? We all know if we're old enough and wise enough that utopias never make it. What a fascinating conversation. That was Anne Speckard, American psychologist and the author of the book Talking to Terrorists. She's also the director of the International Center for the Study of Violent Extremism. And you can find Speckard's counter-narrative videos that she talked about on the ICSVE website. As Americans marked the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 terrorist attack in New York City, it's easy to forget that there is an entire generation of New Yorkers who are too young to remember the horrors of that day. Some were born in the years after, but they all have one thing in common. They grew up in a city coping with the aftermath. What do the 9-11 attacks mean to New York City's young adults and teenagers? Tina Trin explores. Noah Rodriguez was only two at the time, but he thinks about 9-11 as the day the earth stood still. Everyone watching as the Twin Towers burned. And that was important because there's a level of humility to that. And I don't think that's going to be forgotten as much. But having lived through the political turmoil of the past four years and now COVID-19, this medical student says the attacks were just one of many catastrophic events. 9-11 was just another thing on a whole dumpster fire of things that have happened over our lifetimes. The attacks on the World Trade Center undoubtedly changed New York City. But for those who were children during 9-11 or born shortly thereafter, there's some ambivalence as the 20th anniversary approaches. I think most kids, like, they understand conceptually what happened and they can understand that it was a tragedy, but it's not the same thing as living through it. For 16-year-old New Yorker Sarah Malik, 9-11 is a second-hand experience, one told to her by her dad, who worked near the Twin Towers. That disconnect is common. I just think that many of them don't know. It's not that they know, but they don't care. This building in particular uh, is where I lived. Joan Mastropolo of the 9-11 Tribute Museum says the events in their aftermath can become real for younger generations when they hear the stories of survivors. I mean, when I tell them what I, what I saw, what, what I experienced, what I smelled. For 17-year-old Silvana Davi, the day is personal. Her mother was supposed to be in the Twin Towers when the plane struck. If my mom did go, I wouldn't be here. Growing up in a New York suburb where many lost parents, the attack has been a backdrop to her life. She recently wrote a paper about it for her history class. I feel like it should never be forgotten and the new generations that are coming in should learn about it as it is a part of our history. She's also raising money for a 9-11 related charity. I hope it opens other people's eyes to how your life can really be taken in a second and you really appreciate every moment you have. As the country marks the 20th anniversary, future generations will define for themselves what 9-11 means to them. America is burning in a lot of different ways. <laughs> like. I don't know why people have been so focused on this in the grand scheme of things. Tina Trin, VOA News, New York. Join me on the next Straight Talk Africa. We're going to talk about the weather. Climate change is wreaking havoc worldwide and many African countries are already feeling the heat. But is it time we change the way we think and talk about the climate emergency? We look at what's behind the growing call for climate justice across Africa and we'll shine a spotlight on young Africans 